We start with a high-level overview of stablecoin risks. One primary distinction is between custodial stablecoins, with an example being USDT, and non-custodial stablecoins, an example here being DAI. On the custodial side, where we encounter risks including counterparty credit risk, censorship risk, and traditional financial risks. And the good news here is that these are fairly well understood in traditional finance. On the non-custodial side, however, we end up with new risks and new types of attacks, uh, which we'll see throughout the rest of this lecture, including deleveraging risks, price feed and governance risks, minor extractable value, and smart contract bugs. And unfortunately, these are not well understood yet. The custodial side of the tree is composed of several different categories, and these range from a 100% reserve fund that holds assets essentially one for one off chain through a trusted custodian, uh, to structures that resemble fractional reserve and money market funds, um, and, and also including central bank digital currency. And these are all closely connected to traditional economic models of, of these different types of structures. On the non-custodial side of the tree, we have stable coins uh, with on-chain collateral types. And one of these is exogenous collateral. And here we'll see that this, uh, this encounters sort of uh, market deleveraging risks. We also see types of endogenous collateral, and these have amplified feedback effects because the, the value of the collateral is in essence self-referential with the health of the protocol itself. In other words, the collateral uh, pricing itself is endogenous. And also implicit collateral, where uh, it tries to work through incentives without explicit obligations or explicit uh, collateralization itself. So let's dig into the anatomy of a non-custodial stablecoin a little deeper. There are more functions than we've laid out so far, and uh, a stablecoin recipe can be thought of as any combination of these basic ingredients. So one that we've already connected with is this primary value idea or collateral value uh, backing the system, which includes the exogenous, endogenous, and implicit collateral types. This connects with a risk absorption function, uh, which also has a few different forms, namely, equity risk absorption, where there's a secondary fungible position that absorbs the risk, agent risk absorption, where agents can tailor their own risk positions, and protocol risk absorption, where the protocol is holding assets or insurance itself intending to stabilize the system. So how does this risk absorption work? One way is through a leverage-based mechanism, which works kind of similar to a collateralized debt obligation or CDO, where there are speculators who are borrowing stable coins into existence, essentially, against uh, risky collateral. And this is like, like in DAI. And this can happen with exogenous collateral like in DAI or endogenous collateral itself. Uh, and it also includes uh, a subcategory of senior shares where there's a market cap of endogenous equity shares that's meant to absorb the, uh, the volatility. Another is the basis design. And here, there are speculators that are meant to maintain the peg by betting on future supply expansions, which we interpret as, uh, as leverage on our implicit collateral idea before, uh, and they have to do this during a crisis. So in particular, here there's no pre-committed collateral obligation, uh, and instead speculators have to bet that the supply will expand beyond the pre-crisis levels uh, in order to, uh, to, to find this bet profitable. And there's also a reserved back mechanism. And here, uh, this works by the protocol, essentially market making around the peg uh, using an internal asset reserve. And there are also various types of meta stable coins that include combinations of, of, all, of all of these mechanisms. So this uh, also connects with an issuance process, which determines the actual stable coin supply. And this can be agent based. And this is like in DAI where agents uh, are deciding how much to mint and redeem stable coins to decide how much, uh, how much risk they're actually taking on in these leveraged positions. It can include uh, algorithmic issuance uh, in this way, sort of encoded in the smart contract itself. And it also includes the, an, an issuance idea around a deleveraging process that seeks to reduce the supply when the, the, the value of collateral drops. And the remaining elements here are stablecoin holders who seek stability, a governance mechanism and price feeds, which provide required inputs to the system and uh, the governance mechanism allows the system to evolve over time, 
and miners in the background who are tasked with uh, ordering transactions. Let's briefly pull all of these parts together into a concrete example comparing DAI with traditional commercial bank money. Maker governance is roughly parallel to the role played by uh, a central bank, uh, with an important distinction here being that stablecoin governance is profit optimizing, whereas we can usually assume that a central bank is stability seeking for its own right. Uh, to illustrate here, governance in Maker is not necessarily always committed to maintaining the peg. For instance, there have been past discussions in the Maker community uh, at certain times uh, to, to possibly abandon it. Vaults are roughly parallel to the role played by commercial banks in this, in this comparison, uh, with an important distinction being that stablecoin stability, or, or sometimes instability as you have it, depends on the joint actions of all the participating agents, whereas commercial banks are usually assumed to be issuing uh, a money that is assumed to be stable. And lastly, uh, die holders are roughly similar to the role played by depositors in these systems. And because of these, uh, these differences that we've highlighted, the stablecoin side requires new models to, to, to cover this new type of setting. Uh, and essentially we have to hope that the protocol has been well designed and that, that the peg can be maintained through the proper incentives. As we've seen, there are multiple dimensions to consider and the tree that we showed at the beginning is, is it can't really capture all of the different dimensions. Um, so here, we put forward a, a visualization where we can classify things according to three primary dimensions, uh, namely here being the asset backing on the x-axis, the risk absorber type on the y-axis, and then issuance on the, uh, the colored axis. And here we plot where existing projects fall, and we also see that uh, there's several striking regions where the, the stablecoin mechanisms has been especially fragile. And this really motivates us to understand why some mechanisms work better than others.